Truth Plus Media. The show we do is called Iconic Sonics, and we've done it for a few years now. We're in our fourth season. I want to thank our partners, and I would ask all of you, especially in the world of podcasting, which is a little bit competitive, there's a lot out there, uh, we could use your help in supporting all of our partners. So starting with our new partner this year, the Queen Anne Beer Hall. They're a part of the show. Epic Seats, and Epic Seats has given us two tickets to the Blazers-Nets game next month in Portland. Epic Seats, we thank them. Simply Seattle, I imagine a lot of you wearing Sonics gear got it from Simply Seattle, and we thank them. Dick's Drive-In Restaurants, they've been with us since day one. They've been such great supporters of the show. Rise Above is an organization that helps Native American youth who are at risk. They have joined us this year as a partner. The iconic Edgewater Hotel down on the water and my alma mater, KJR Radio. They're all partners for our podcast, and we thank them for the support. And we ask you to support them to, uh, to help keep the podcast healthy and strong. And please welcome to the Queen Anne Beer Hall stage. It's his first night ever in a beer hall, ladies and gentlemen, Detlef Shrimp. The soft-spoken Detlef Shrimp. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a live recording of Iconic Sonics here at the Queen Anne Beer Hall with two absolute icons, George Carl and Detlef Shrimp. And I, I got to say, you, you went into the Hall of Fame this year, and you, you know, no coach gets there without great players. I'm going to assume this guy is one of your favorite players you ever coached. I think that might be – he no, says no. No, I – You can be truthful. I can take it. <laughs> I think you're so good that I think you should be in the Hall of Fame, to be honest with you. You know, it's – and you and I talked about this, and I know you're not worried about it. You went into the FIFA Hall of Fame this past year, so congratulations for that. Uh, you were among the first European stars here. You were very, very good, if not great, at a lot of different things. I think there's an argument to be made for you. I know you're not worried about it, but I'm going to keep making the argument because I'm stubborn. Is that okay? Well, I don't understand the process, so I don't know uh, how it works. I, I know someone has to be your advocate and campaign for you. Uh, but, again, it's great if it happens. If it doesn't, no big deal. Yeah. Your, uh, your memories and coming down here for a game night in this neighborhood. It's an exhibition game tonight, but it's the NBA. Are you, I, I asked George, are you have a little deja vu feeling as you come into Queen Anne for, a, for an October basketball game? Well, it's a little different when you come in and having a beer before you actually go to the arena. So, <laughs> You guys yeah. didn't do that? I always thought the 96 Sonics were fueled on beer. Let's say I, I didn't do it. <laughs> um, no, it, it is great. You know, it's great to have the, uh, the arena back. It's obviously a new arena. But it's beautiful. It's uh, it's a great environment. I think it's ready for basketball. And if you go into the game tonight, you see what it's what it's all about. That looks like you get uh, score ten tonight. Could you go out there and get some something done out there? You look I, great. I can barely walk a straight line. There's no running in my life. <laughs> what do you think of when you think back on debt as a player? What what made debt great? Then I had a lot of conversations about him being too perfect. He did everything right. He knew the schemes. He knew the plays. He knew the concepts. I mean, he was saying, yeah, he got angry at everybody because some of the guys didn't know all that stuff. <laughs> but, you know, that was the most efficient basketball player I've ever coached. Efficient means any time he touched the ball, something good usually happened. And I thought he was a marvelous compliment to Gary and Sean. Because Gary and Sean are a little crazy. Deadlift is kind of even keel, solid, fundamental, down to earth. Gary and, Gary and Sean drove me crazy. That brought me down to earth. When, that, that when, when Gary and Sean would be off on one of their things, and, and the coach could be a little crazy sometimes too. So they're going, they're going all this way. You and like Sam or you and Nate, you know, 
kind of even keel guys, you over there going, I can't believe we're going through this again. I mean, you guys recognize your role, right, of trying to be the, the rudder of the ship. No, I think we had a great combination of some veteran leadership uh, that, you know, guys have been around the block and um, have played with different crazies over the years. <laughs> and so, you know, I don't know if it's Gary and Sean are coming, but, uh, you know, Gary and I argued every day. Yeah. You know, we fought every day and it'd be like, you know, F you, no, F you, F you. It was like <laughs> every day because Gary didn't want to practice. And, and so Nate, Sam and I would guilt him into practicing. And he ended up suiting up most of the practices to scrimmage. Yeah. Um, so we, we had a, we had a dysfunctional, but functional team because we were nuts. And the coach was part of that coach was coach was right there. I mean, I, I think I think he was the right coach for this bunch, you know, because of that. I mean, because you you did you you and again we laughed about it again last night. You and Gary connected because you were actually a lot alike. He was wild and crazy, stubborn. Um, he was at times really difficult. He fought. We fought all the time. But the one thing I gave Gary when the game started, he played basketball. He played right. it real hard and really well. And that was, that's the other thing. Gary, you know, the, the whole practice thing became kind of an ongoing joke. The game nights, you, ne you never complained about Gary not giving it all on a game night. When the, game, when the lights are on, he was ready to rock. No, we, we played hard. We played hurt. Uh, you know, guys suited up every night. Um, you literally had to have something seriously wrong not to play. Yeah. And our, our team, everyone played. Did you ever find yourself, like, watching – Gary and Sean, like you're out there on the floor, you got stuff to do. But I mean, those two, they could put on a show with some of the stuff they could do. Oh, yeah. It was, you know, you see Sean do stuff where you kind of go, wow. Uh, or you do stuff where you kind of go, man, don't make it so complicated on yourself. Mm -hmm. It usually was the baseline spin trying to reverse dunk when he could have had a layup. Uh, <laughs> but I always yelled at Gary because I thought I was more open on the fast break, but I never got the ball. <laughs> Never. We, we couldn't find one assist from Gary to you. There is not two. There are two. We're going to find them on the video and, and look for them. Hey, we were uh, talking earlier today, and you said, you know, I, I brought up Detlef is one of, if not the first European stars to come over here. And, and, and some say he's the best still. There's been a lot of other guys. What about the state of the European game? I know you want to talk to Det a little bit about that and, and, and the, the amount of guys still coming over. Well, I think we're amazed in the NBA today, three of our top five players – or from Europe or Africa. Uh, I think, Virginia, you probably know more about European basketball than I. Supposedly the number one draft pick in the, in the draft this coming year is a 7'5 Frenchman. I hear he's really good. Uh, I know that about 10 teams are already, already trying to lose games to get that guy. Uh, but to me, Dedlif, I had Tony Crew coach and Dedlif. And I think they're two of the top five players in Europe. Zabonis, maybe. And now you're a little, I'm missing somebody along the way. But just because of your connection and coming here and opening the window for the European player, I think that's a part of his Hall of Fame credentials. Right. And then... I mean, the thing is, Deadlift might not have been a great player, but he was a very good player every night. As a coach, I like a guy that comes every night as much as a guy that goes here, here, here. Deadlift came every night. And um, I hope someday you get that recognition. Uh -huh. Dead. When you were uh, when you were growing up in in Germany, going to the beer halls when you were seven years old, when when you started realizing, okay, I'm I'm kind of good at basketball. Did you have American players that you followed? Were you able to pay? You know, I, I don't know what it was like over there. Obviously, at that point in time, were, were you able to follow the NBA a little bit and and, and pay attention to that? Uh, no, not at all. So, I grew up obviously in Germany playing soccer like everyone else does. Right. You uh, you. You kick a soccer ball when you can walk. And uh, I didn't start playing basketball until I was 13 years old. 
and uh, just by accident uh, changed schools. And my PE, my PE teacher uh, it was John Ecker, who played at UCLA with Bill Walton. And he was my PE teacher, and he introduced basketball in PE. And I was like, wow, this is cool. And uh, he goes, well, you should come to the club. So literally three months later, I was on a club team. And uh, three years later, I was in the U.S. And and, and, that, and so it happened that fast. Yeah. So had, had you said, like, did you not see NBA basketball until you came here, like on TV or anything? No. I saw some uh, – some lovely, uh, like eight track, whatever it's called, the videos, you know, those old ones, reels of, uh, yeah, I think it was Jabbar in his college, uh, final college game. I really? saw like a black and white of that. That's the only thing I've ever seen until I was in, in high school. Yeah. Weren't you one of the first guys to come to high school before you went to college? Yes. Why, was there someone that pushed you to do that? Um, you know, I, f I felt at 16, I was the best player in Germany, my age class. Um, and there are a couple other guys in Germany had gone to the States for a year and came back and were better. So, yeah, I thought I'd go to, to the States for one year, come back and play in the semi-pro league and be the star. <laughs> <laughs> How often do you go back to Germany? I usually go back at least twice a year. Um, I didn't go for two years during COVID. I just went back last month to see my folks. Yeah. Is uh, uh, as you look at it now, is the I mean the European pipeline is obviously going to continue, and the game is very popular over there. Um, it's fueled the growth of the league. It's why you know when people talk about expansion and adding two more teams, there's a lot of talent out there, isn't there? I mean, I don't think it's going to be hard to find 24 basketball players to stock two NBA teams? Uh, no, no, it's not. There's a lot of talent everywhere. And, uh, you know, the NBA said that by 2028 20, or so, 30% uh, of the NBA players will be from Africa, either wow. directly or through colleges or whatever. Um you know, they, they invested in Africa through NBA Africa, and they have teams there and schools and all that. Uh, and there's talent everywhere, Latin America, Europe. Um, you know, as George knows, there's enough talent in the world that's more, can you put the teams together to be competitive or you just dilute the league by having a lot of mediocre teams. Right. We talk about expansion, and everybody's excited to see the Sonics come back. I think everybody's optimistic that that day is coming. And last week, we get online a little video of three kids trying to decide who the mascot for the Kraken should be, and their consultant is none other than Detlef Shrimp. And you suggested Squatch, and they said, well, wait a minute. We can't do that because the Sonics are coming back. So everybody now thinks you've got some kind of insight into when the Sonics are, are, are going to be back here. First of all, that must have been a fun thing to do with those. I like when the one kid says, I wasn't even born back then. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, they did a really nice job with it because I thought the stuff I said was very awkward and they, <laughs> they made it work. So uh, it, it came out pretty good. Uh, they had a couple other ideas that uh, I didn't go with. Uh, yeah. <laughs> as you can imagine, seafoods, you know, yeah, my yeah. last name. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I don't have any insights. Uh, I think like everyone else, we're hoping that we get an expansion team, but that's probably our best bet. Are you optimistic that it's going to happen without having insight? Just as a, you, know, you read the papers, you listen to the stuff, so it sounds like it may happen. Are, are you optimistic? Yeah, I think with uh, the TV contract expiring after this season, uh, then reallocating where the money goes, it makes sense to add two teams and go to 32 teams. Uh, but even if that happens, you know, the NBA is going to go through a process of an RFP. Uh, Seattle and Vegas are not the only two cities that want a team. There are probably a dozen teams out there. Right. So they got to all have, do an RFP and why, why we should have a team, what the ownership structure is, where the money is, what the arena is. You know, that's three years out. Maybe. Yeah, it sounds like it. George and I talked last night about 
you know, the work he's done with uh, dropping the Dime Foundation, helping them in Indianapolis to help former ABA players get a little bit of assistance if they need it. I know you're involved a little bit, and I was thrilled to see it, and I wanted to jump in right away. I think it's called the Sonics Legends Fund, and people can do a search for it. But there are some former Sonic players who are struggling a little bit and need a little bit of help, like we all do sometimes in life. Tell me a little bit about this and, and how you got involved and, 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 and where we see this going, because it's a great thing. Yeah, if, uh, for some of you who know, um, you know that the NBA has supported uh, the Legends players that need medical help, uh, but there's a limit to the funds they provide. And uh, two of our legends, Slick Watts and Gus Williams, had uh, strokes. Uh, Gus had a stroke a little over two years ago, and he was on uh, he was in a coma for nine months. Oh, wow. And um, you know he's he's in a wheelchair. Uh, Slick is in a wheelchair. He lost uh, movement of most of his right side. They both can barely speak, uh, so they need rehab. They don't have the finances. Uh, so the Sonics Legends Fund will help them pay for those services that are needed. And it's interesting because there are still players who played at a time where, you know, the money's always been good for basketball, but it's in a whole different stratosphere now. And it was different when you played, and it was different when Slick and Gus played. So it's easy to see how a guy could get to a point where, look, man, they, they need help. I mean, but without getting into the whole thing, our health care system can be a little bit tricky in this country sometimes. I think it's terrific that you guys are doing this. and this kind of, I think it's another group that's doing it, and you're just kind of helping them as a spokesman. Yeah. But, it's but it's me. great. Yeah, I'm just helping out. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, you don't want to forget those guys. And a guy, I mean, we saw Slick last night. and Keep a good thought about Slick because he's, he's struggling and he's trying to get better, but it's hard. I mean, it's, it's you know, the physical ailments, it, it can be tough. I mean, helping the, the former players, I know it's near and dear to your heart and it's for anybody. I mean, well, you, I'm an ABA guy. I played in the ABA, and the NBA just gave the ABA $25 million to help. I think there's 130 ABA players left alive. We lost two this week. And of those 130, I would say a lot of them are struggling. We have guys who are dying homeless, guys dying in, you know, on the streets. And it's sad. I mean, it's sad, guys, that you compete against. No, they're all about my age, and they do need help. And Dropping Dimes is a great organization, but I think every city has got to help sometimes, somewhat with, and as you said, a guy in his 70s didn't make a, a lot. They made a lot of money, but they didn't make millions. Right. And uh, if they didn't invest correctly, you know, they have struggles, like we all do. And uh, I just think we need to be more more aware of the guys that helped the NBA get where they are now. Remember the guys that put in the work, put in the work before what, the game blowing up like it's blown up. All right, when we wrap up this segment, last question. You know, we think of you as a Sonic. We think of you as a Husky. I still think of you as a Pacer once in a while. But you were a blazer on a really good Portland team. They're in town tonight. I know that year was a, a special year for you. I know you hate the way it ended. But man, oh man, was that a good Portland team. And may, maybe if things had been a little different, they should have gone on to the NBA Finals, huh? Um, oh, yeah, we, we should have won that year. You know, we had a, a team of all-stars. Uh, but like we always said, the... The, the, playoffs, the playoffs are a reflection of your shortcomings during the regular season. And our shortcomings were that we didn't have a good culture. Most of the guys didn't work hard and everyone complained. And then when things go wrong in the playoffs, that just multiplies. Right. And uh, that's why we didn't win it, you know. And that was kind of my last go at it. So yeah. it was well, unfortunate. It was a memorable series. And funny, one last thing. You talk about culture, and, and that 95-96 Sonics team had a great culture, and there's no better example than what you just said there. You guys are down 3-0 to the Bulls. You could have just turned it around and, and, uh, and, and called it a day, and instead 
you got off the mat and you win a couple of games and take it back to Chicago. I mean, that's the difference with a team that believes in each other, right? When 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 all looks done, you're like, nope, we're gonna win a couple of games and take it back to Chicago. Yeah, I mean, we we had a rough start in the finals, yeah. and uh, you know, we were sitting there after game three, and we we got our butts handed to us in game three, and we got. We can't go down like this. So, you know, we said we're not losing at home. And, uh, you know, we took it back to Chicago. Unfortunately, it's tough to win there. Yeah. It was uh, it was fun, though. I watched that series during COVID. It wasn't a very good offensive series. No. It was just a defensive battle. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know how many people know the story, but I think we lost that series because of travel. Because we lost game two on a Friday night and flew back. And we played Sunday at 12. And we, we had, we got back into, I got to bed like at five or six in the morning. And we never got a rest. And we played awful in game three. And after that, we played really well. So it's amazing how sometimes what happens off the court affects what happens on the court. Well, what happened on the court was one of the most memorable stories in this city's history. And I'll tell you what, no shame in losing to that Jordan team. They were a, they were a pretty darn good bunch. We'll take a break. We've got more to come. Thanks to George Carl, the head coach. Thanks to Detlef Shrimp, the future Hall of Famer. It's Iconic Sonics. I'm Mike Gastineau. 